Uh, I've got a question tonight that I thought I'd answer. I, I, I get this question a lot. I think I've talked about it before. But uh, the, the, the question came up several times in, in the last uh, couple of weeks, actually twice at the Bible conference out there, one of the Q&As. And also I've gotten this question in the mail. And that is, there's an awful lot of discussion about the rapture. I, I've talked the last couple of weeks about uh, the fact that the, the rapture is pre-trib, that is pre-70th week. And the question then is, is there, a, is there a time period between the rapture and the beginning of the, of the tribulation, the beginning of the 70th week? And is, does the rapture take place and then boom, the seven-year tribulation take place? Or is there a time period before, between the rapture and the beginning of the 70th week itself? And the answer to that is yes. There is. It's it, it, oftentimes you would you hear people, and and I don't complain about these folks, but it's just not thought thinking it through very carefully. You'd say people say the rapture, and then seven years later the second advent, and the, and, and the kingdom starts. But it's not going to be that way. The seven-year period is the seventieth week of Daniel, chapter number nine, and the sixty-nine weeks take place, and then the seventh week is, is still future. But there's a period of time between when the rapture of the body of Christ goes out, the dispensation of grace is over, and that 70th week actually begins. And one of the ways you know that is you just read Daniel chapter 9, read the prophecy. If you start in verse number 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So the first 69 weeks are going to be in two parts. It's going to be seven weeks, that's 49, 49 years, and three score and two weeks, the street should be built again and, the time, and, and, and uh, built again and the, the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah the prince be, be, uh, be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and the end of the war, de, uh, end of the war desolations are determined unto the end of the war of desolation to determine, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So you've got, 60, you've got seven weeks and 62 weeks in verse 25. and verse 27, you've got the 70th week. So that, there's, there's the 70th week in verse 20, 27. But notice in verse 26, after three score and two weeks. So what you've got is you, you've got a situation where if you, you just draw a timeline, you've got a seven-week period, then you've got a 62-week period, and then he says, after 62 weeks, Messiah's going to be cut off. That's the crucifixion. Then there's going to be troublous times, and then over here, you're going to have a 70th week. So in the prophecy... There's a, there's a, there's a, you've got 69 weeks back here, total. And verse 26 says, after six, so in the prophecy, there's stuff that takes place after the 69th week and before the 70th week. So in Daniel's prophecy, there's a gap between 69 and 70 in which things are, you're told prophetically, going to take place. Verse 26, after the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Now, that's a description of the crucifixion. Isaiah 53, he says he's cut off from the land of the living, but not for himself. And the people of the princes shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. So Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. The temple's going to be destroyed. All in this period of time right here. Now, also during this period of time, you have the dispensation of, the grace, of, the, of grace where the body of Christ is being formed. So in that prophetic gap, there's also a secret gap that isn't in prophecy, okay? Now, if you come with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, when the rapture takes place, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. For well, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And this is Paul describing the events that are that we that we call the rapture. 
The rapture itself is a momentary, it's an it's a event that takes place in the moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's when the resurrection of, of the body of Christ, the dead are raised, the living get, get changed. This is the point at which you get your glorified body. This is the moment in which the dispensation of grace is concluded, comes to an end. No more members of the body of Christ are going to be added. The body is completed, and it goes to be with the Lord. That's the event we call the rapture, the catching away, snatching away, some people call it. Uh, Paul calls it the adoption. The, uh, uh, the term rapture, you know, that, that's, we, we make that, it comes from the, the, when he talks about being caught up. Uh, the, the Latin word there is, is, is the word we get our word rapture from. And it doesn't matter what you call it. it this, is, this is the event. But this is a momentary event. This event doesn't extend over a long period of time. Verse 15 this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend. Here's the details. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Those three sounds. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So at that, at that event... The dead are raised, the living get their glorified bodies, we're caught up, the Lord comes, we meet the Lord in the air, and then he takes us back into heaven. Chapter 3, verse 13 says he takes us back to be presented to the Father. Now, that event ends the dispensation of grace. When he says, the Lord shall descend with a shout, he comes, that tells you that the dispensation of grace is over. In the dispensation of grace, the heavens are silent. Sir Robert Anderson wrote a book years ago called The Silence of God. God isn't speaking from heaven today. God isn't speak He only speaks through his, word, his written word today. In Israel's program, often he spoke audibly and spoke directly. In fact, when he comes back at the second advent over here, he says he's going to roar out of Zion. He's going to come with a, the conquering hero's roar. So there's going to be noise then. So when you go back into Israel's program, the silence of heaven is over with. Today, God is not, not, not imputing the world's trespasses unto itself. He's not out here trying to punish the world, trying to get even, trying to move things. He's, he's just letting, he, he's in an in a amnesty situation. When the Lord comes with that shout, that's an, an announcement that the dispensation of grace is over. And that's the shout of resurrection. All the, all the, they come in all the other graves shall hear my voice. And that's sort of like the Lord standing at, at Lazarus' grave and, and, and cries with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And so that's, the, that's the, the resurrection shout. The voice of the archangel, the archangel is, is in Daniel 11, I'm sorry, Daniel 12, is, is the angel that, that leads the armies of God in defense of the nation Israel. He's going to begin again, not only is the dispensation of grace over, but he's going to go back to Israel's prophetic program. So the dispensation of grace ends and the prophetic program begins again, restarts at this point. So now prophecy is going to begin again. If you look at chapter 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, the, and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. The Antichrist has two characters. First half of the seventh week, he's the man of sin. The second half of the week, he's the son of perdition. And we don't have time to get into all that, but there's some dramatic things that take place in his life and so forth that change all that. But he, he's, he's Satan's man. He starts out the, son, the, the, the man of sin. The manifestation of, uh, of, 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 of man's sinful plan of rebellion. Then he becomes the son of perdition, the vehicle of the of the satanic policy of evil in its fullness, who opposes and exalts the verse four, uh, himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's going. To be, that's the seventh week. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity hath doth already work 
Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So there's something right now in the dispensation of grace that is, that is holding, hindering, holding back the manifestation of the man of sin. What is it that's holding back the fulfillment of, 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 the, of the prophecy in the seventh week? The dispensation of grace. But when this is over, when our dispensation is over, we're taken out, prophecy begins again. There's an interesting thing about what withholdeth. The thing that restrains Satan's ability to accomplish his ultimate goal in the world today is the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace. We had discussions uh, over the weekend about how, what do you do? You, you're, you're, you go out and, and how, how, do you, how do you oppose what the government does when the government seeks to overturn things? And, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, take over. And, and, and you see, in our situation, you see the, the culture crumbling around you. What do you do? Well, right now, where we are now, the first thing I think you need to do is realize that uh, it's too late to do what you want to do. Uh, you, we, if I've said it for many years. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't put it back in. And reclaiming the school systems, reclaiming the... Listen, 25 years ago was when that needed to be done. And you were busy making a living, having your kids, buying your house, and all that stuff back not paying attention to it, and they came in and sucked it out from under you. And today, as it crumbles down around you, fight the battle that you need to fight, not the one you should have fought 25 years ago. And the, the issues are be aware of where you are, not where you, where, where you, not where you want to be, and the battle's over. So you say, well, but what, what should you be doing? Paul tells us we're good soldiers. Don't, don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. What we do in preaching the truth and standing for the truth and resisting the, 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 uh, the, the, the world system, we're not going to defeat the world system. We're gonna, but we can restrain it. We can hinder it. We can hold it back. It's never going to quit trying to overcome us because its ultimate goal is that it's going to accomplish uh, eventually that seventh week is going to be there. But the time for that isn't now. And what we can be is a restrainer. We can hold it back as best we can. And that's what truth does. It, it holds back the live program. And so it doesn't mean you just give up, but it means you, 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 you act sensibly, you act knowledgeably, and you act where the real battle is. And you can restrain things. And as restrainers, we're, we, when it talks about you withhold it, it talks about letting, you let. That's an old English word. Uh, the word let can be used in an English dictionary six different ways. Do you know that? You can let out a piece of property. You rent it out. And, you know, I, I've heard that all my life down south. People say, we, 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 we let out the place. You meant you rent it. And, you know, we, most of the time you think of let and kind of just give permission to something. I, I, I remember, I've told you this before, I, I, don't, I never played tennis, don't know anything about tennis, don't care anything about tennis. Got friends that play, and I don't even admire them. But when, when, a ball, when you serve a ball in tennis and the ball hits the net, and the umpire says, I thought he used to say, net, that's what I thought he was saying. Then I read, I read in a magazine article about, a, about John McEnroe. You guys remember John, see you too. You guys are too young to remember John McEnroe. I, everybody I remember is so old, nobody remembers him anymore. He, and he, he used to fight and fuss with the umpires. And they said they called a, a net call. I said, net? He's not, he say, he's not saying net. He's saying let. Because when the tennis ball hits that net, it's hindered. And then the call is let. In tennis, that's the call. And that's the way the word's used here. It's used in a sense of, if you, if, you, if you let a bucket down into a well, do you let it, allow it to go or do you hinder it from going? Well, if you didn't have the rope on it, you go right on down to the bottom. So really, you're, in a sense, you're allowing it to go, but in another sense, you're hindering it. 
Well, in the context here, that hindered, it's obviously hindered because he, he, he says that in, in the verse, uh, what withholdeth. But the thing that is keeping back the seventh week and the prophetic events in chapter 9, verse 26, is the dispensation of grace. But once our dispensation is over with, Katie, bar the door. So once the dispensation of grace is over with, things are going to move rather quickly. You see how he says in verse 6, Now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. What's his time? Verse 8, Then shall that wicked be revealed. Satan has been waiting for 6,000 years to get that moment. And when the moment comes where, you, where in the prophetic scheme it's time to go for him to have that opportunity, he's not going to be sitting around saying, well, should I really do this or not? He's ready. He's primed. He's going to move quickly. And the things that you read back here in Daniel chapter 9, he's going to move on those things. And the thing you have to remember, go back to the book of Daniel. Come back to Daniel chapter 7. In the book of Daniel... There are things, like in chapter 9 there, that have to take place in connection with the rise of the Antichrist, the rise of the man of sin, the son of perdition, that are going to take place before the 70th week. So in prophecy, if you, you take the body of Christ out of the picture, there are still things that take place in Daniel before the moment the 70th week begins by the way, just go back to chapter 9, just to verse 27, just so you, you notice carefully. 9.27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So how, does the, how do you know when the seventh week begins? When he confirms the covenant. So the confirmation of that covenant is the moment, that's, the, that's when the, the clock starts ticking on that last seven years. Just like back in verse 25, when the decree uh, from the commandment to go forth and restore and rebuild Jerusalem, there was a moment when that commandment went forth. It's in Nehemiah chapter 2. You can nail it down there, and you can start counting the 69 weeks, the seventh weeks from there. So there's a point in which the Antichrist is going to, boom, sign that covenant, make that covenant with, with, with many, and the week begins. But prior to that, there's some things that have to take place. For example... Look back in chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, there, there's a... <coughs> excuse me. I'll just warn you, there's a prophecy here that uh, this is my personal, individual, private, subjective opinion based on reading the verses. It's different from what Larkin, Schofield, and the standard, you know, Jack Van Impey type tribulation teaching is the standard teaching is that daniel 7 matches the, the four beasts in daniel 7 match the four kingdoms in daniel chapter 2 i don't think that's true two reasons one there aren't four kingdoms in daniel 2 there are five and these four beasts the daniel the four kingdoms in daniel 2 start with babylon the next one is media persia then there's greece and so forth but those kingdoms start, Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Well, in chapter 7, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had, he had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the, of the matter. Now, verse 2, well, verse two. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse, one from another. So Daniel sees four beasts. If you look down to verse number 24, or verse 17, let's do that. Daniel's going to get the, the uh, interpretation. Verse 15, Daniel, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the thing. These great beasts, which are 
four or four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now notice the interpretation is that these four beasts you see, Dan, are four beasts that are going to arise, shall, future. Okay? When did Daniel see this vision? Verse 1, Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now Belshazzar in chapter 5 is the last king of Babylon. Belshazzar falls to the Persians in Daniel 5. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar's the grandson. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, decades before Belshazzar, was the king of Babylon. Here, Belshazzar is at the end of, of the reign of Babylon's already a king. Babylon's already a kingdom. Well, if these four beasts are four beasts that shall arise, then Babylon isn't one of them because Babylon's already there. At the end of the Babylonian kingdom, there are four more kingdoms that are going to come. So he's not, he's, not, he's not duplicating chapter 2. He's talking about something entirely different. So I don't think that the, these, these beasts are the duplicate. I think these beasts are something quite different. And I'm not going to get into all that tonight, but I'm just telling you we're looking to something future from that. Now where are you going to be? You're going to be in the seventh week of Daniel. Oh, I, I shouldn't say that. We're going to be in the tribulation period. He's looking for beast, and we're going to be in this period of time right here. It'll, it'll be after the rapture, this period of time after the rapture, and before the 70th week, before he makes the, the covenant here. So we're going to be in this period of time right here. Verse number 24, verse number 23. Then shall the fourth beast, <coughs> then the fourth beast, then the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the, now watch, the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another, king, another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the times. That's going to be the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is going to come out of that fourth kingdom. But notice the sequence. Verse 24, the ten horns out of that kingdom are going to be ten kings. So this kingdom is going to have ten horns. Out of them, out of, well, go back and read the verse. After, and another, another shall arise after them, and he's going to subdue three of them. So here's the Antichrist. He's going to arise after these ten are there, the ten are there. He's going to take over those ten by subduing three of them. Three of them are going to give up. He's going to subdue them, whip them. The rest will abdicate to him and when the when when that week starts he's got he's got all of them now think about what that verse is. it says after the 10 he does that so if the antichrist starts the week here as the head of those 10 kings they had to arise before him you see that in that verse after And others shall arise after them, be diverse from the first, subdue the three, and he becomes the Antichrist. So there are, there are things in that verse. Those ten kings have to be there before the seventh week. Antichrist has to arise after those ten, ten kings are there, takes over, and goes into the week. So wherever you put the beginning of the week there, it has to be after those ten kings are there. So there, there is a political realignment that has to take place in the Middle East where those ten kings show up and are there, and the Antichrist comes out after they're there. My point simply is that there are things that have to take place in prophecy prior to the beginning of the seventh week that have to take place in that gap. They'll take place after the rapture, before the seventh week, and those ten kings have to be there. 
Now, that's when the man of sin takes, does all that thing. That's the time period, if you've ever thought about, when this guy takes over here, he has to be a grown man in a, in a position of power. It takes some time to grow. <laughs> in other words, the rapture takes place, where did he come from? Well, he, had to, he had, has to already be there. The preparation for this guy is going to take a period of time. I don't think it's going to be a long time because Satan isn't going to be waiting around just saying, well, I just think I'll, I'll just, you know, he's interested in getting it done. He'll have his guys available all time. Come over to chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. This is another one of these passages that is uh, kind, of, kind of interesting. If you, if you saw chapter 11, and I also in the first year of Darius, the Mede, the Medes followed the Babylonians. Even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall rise, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up against all against the king of Grecia, or the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do great and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be diverse, uh, I'm sorry, divided toward the, the four winds of, of heaven and not to his posterity, not, nor according to his dominion, which he ruleth, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even as others beside him. Now, that's a reference to Persia being followed by Greece. Now, go back to chapter 8 and notice how he's already told you about this. In Daniel 8. Daniel gets, he gets information that helps you interpret the times of the Gentiles. Nebuchadnezzar sees the image, gets the, th those kingdoms, and then Daniel then begins to fill in who they are and how they're going to function, move from one to the next. In Daniel 8, in the third reign of, the king Bel uh, of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to Daniel, and he sees the ram and the he goat. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the vision that he sees, verse 3, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. And I saw the ram rush pushing west and northward and southward, so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But he did according to his will and, was, and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen stand, standing before the river, and ran unto him in fury, in, in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close un, unto the ram, and he mo was moved with choler against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the, the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he-goat waxed great, very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and it, was, it, came, to, it came up, and, and, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the heavens. Now, out of one of them, out of one of those four notable ones, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And that little horn, as you keep reading, is the Antichrist. So what you have in verse 8 is you have something that took place in history back in the days of Greece. When Greece was, was, was broken up, it was divided into four sections. And out of one of those sections, in the future, the Antichrist is going to come. So he jumps from the past in verse 8 to the future from us in verse 9. Now watch him, notice down in verse number 20 as he interprets this. 
the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. That would be Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for him, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the, na of, of, of the nation, out of Greece, and not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, now we're in the future, when the transgressions are, are come to the full, the king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sayings shall stand, and then he goes on to describe the Antichrist. So the Antichrist is going to come out of one of the four divisions of the Greek Empire. Now when you come to Daniel chapter 11, he's going to tell you which of the four divisions the Antichrist is going to come out of. <laughs> That's why it starts out talking about Greece and Persia, and Greece being divided, and four kingdoms coming out of it, because you, you, you've understood that in chapter 8. And so when he talks about in Daniel 11 verse 4, Greece being divided into, into the four winds of heaven. Now he's going to talk to you about two kingdoms that come out. Here are going to be the two legs in the, in the image in Daniel chapter 2. Verse number 5, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be, uh, at, and one of his princes, and he shall sta be strong above him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And in the end of the years, now you move from verse 5 to verse 6, and you've moved from the past into the future. Okay? So from verse 6 on, we're no longer in the past. Now, everybody, every commentator you read, Schofield, Larkin, Sir Robert, all of them, they, they, put, they put verse 5 all the way down to verse number 21 in the past. Because verse 21 is where the Antichrist shows up. I'm saying to you that between verse 6 and verse 21 is not the past. It's things that are going to take place in this period of time right here. And if you want to know some of the details of what's going to be going on here politically and, and so forth in the Middle East during that period of time, that's going to read like the, the, that pastor, I think, going to read like the daily newspaper. And there's a conflict back and forth between the king of the south, that's the king of Egypt, verse 8, and the king of the north, that's the king of Syria. And those two kingdoms go back and forth. In fact, in verse number 15, so the king of the north shall come. There, there's a king of the north. But when you come down to verse number uh, 20, then shall stand in his estate a razor of... There's a second king of the north. Then when you come to verse 21, and in his estate shall stand up, up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in, in peaceably and obtain the kingdom with flattery. And you read on it, that's the Antichrist. So the 70th week is going to begin in verse 21. And there are going to be three kings of the north that will be there being dealt with during this period. Obviously there's a gap here in prophecy that prophecy fills up with details in the book of Daniel. Those things will take place after the dispensation of grace is over. What's keeping those things from happening now is the dispensation of grace. So yes, there is going to be a gap after the rapture, before the 70th week, filled up with these things in the prophetic program that are there, that are necessary, and there are other things too. By the way, in verse 21 and 22, that, that's the time the the, that battle over in Psalm 83 is going to take place. So all kinds of things are going to be going on during this period of time. And they're going to be withdrawn. W w they're being withheld now because the dispensation of grace withhold of those things. So as soon as we go out, all the different things, and there, there's, there, there are another dozen things like that that take place during that time period, they will begin to all that program will begin to matriculate itself through. So could there be stage-setting events that, that take place during the before the dispensation of grace is over that set the stage for that? Well, certainly there can. Because in all of these scenarios, this period of time here assumes 
that the nation Israel is back in the land. They all assume there is a nation, a nation state of Israel. That it's a national, the nation is in the land in unbelief. And there's a, they're, they're a state, they're a literal state. 1947, they became a state. That's why all the prophecy preachers, listen, 100 years ago when, when Schofield and Larkin, and these guys wrote, wrote about this stuff, the nation Israel was not a nation. And there was really no vision on the future that they ever would be a nation. I've got some, I've got some books written by Arnold C. Gabeline. Gabeline was one of the, one of the premier uh, prophetic students and preachers and teachers back in 100 years ago. And he, 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 he wrote with finesse and great accuracy about uh, these prophecies. And he, had, he didn't, there, there was no nation of Israel. And people laughed at him, laughed up their sleeve at him that, that, that there would ever be an, ever be an Israel. And uh, he wrote in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And yet, 1947, 48, there became one. Well, then everybody jumped on the bandwagon and said, oh, yeah, prophecy's been for, well, what, can you, can you name me the verse? Show me the verse. See, people, people, people do this. They say, well, that's, that's prophecy being fulfilled. Well, which ex verse exactly was that? I watched a, a video. God help me, people send me videos. I don't watch videos when people send them to me. <laughs> I don't have time, okay? Uh, someone asked me, he said, did you ever teach about so-and-so? I said, yeah, I, I remember teaching about that. But where, I got no idea where it's at. Debbie asked me something. This, somebody said, Brother Rick said so-and-so on a, on, on a tape that he had. I said, I have no idea what he's talking about. I don't know what, a, what a offer, some offer that I made on the radio. So I don't, I said it, but I don't remember it. Did you ever do that? You know, I, God told me 30 years ago, said, if you make a living with your mouth, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I, don't, I, you know, I, don't, I don't remember everything I've ever said. Uh, Sometimes I find, hear myself say something, I disagree with myself. You, I, you, don't, you don't ever do that, I know, but occasionally I do. And uh, anyway, you, 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 you see these things. This, I, this video, this woman I said, please watch this, just five minutes. And it was a, a video of this, this charismatic woman preacher. So you know I was really excited about that. She's a prophet. And she says, we have entered into the era of the Holy Spirit in 2022. This is going to be the era. And I'm thinking, are you nuts? You know, if she's a Pentecostal, didn't you ever hear about Pentecost? <laughs> You know, the the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, and how does what's the Holy what's the Holy Spirit doing today? Well, it's not causing people to run run aisles and bark, bark like chick, chick, uh, dogs and cluck like chickens and get the holy laugh and and the heebie-jeebies, all that stuff that people are talking about. Go read Romans eight and see what the Holy Spirit's doing. Go read Galatians five, see what the Holy Spirit's that's what He's doing today, not all that stuff. And she's got all the. And I asked, I said, could you show me a verse that says what that lady's saying? Well, Brother Rick, you, you got to have a verse? Why, you, you just got to have the Bible all the time? I said, uh-huh. Yeah. You know why? It's what God the Holy Spirit wrote. That's how he talks. And she got a little mad at me. Well, I was glad because I didn't have to talk to her anymore. But that's where you find what the Spirit of God's doing is in his word. Not all this stuff out there that people talk about. But when you hear about these things, well, where, where is the verse that says what happened in 1947 is being fulfilled? Will Israel go back into the land? Yes. Will they become a nation state? Yes. Will they do it in, 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 in unbelief? Yes. You say, well, maybe that's, uh, that's it. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not. You understand the nation of Israel could get wiped out tomorrow? And not be there for 500 years, it wouldn't change any of this. This is what's going to happen when God does it. When God brings them back. Could there be some stage setting events before the dispensation of grace is over with? I would be assuming that there could be. Because there are going to be some things that are going to take place when we go out that 
are going to be in place. That thing in Daniel chapter 7, he's going to destroy the city. Then the city had to be there. He's going to destroy the temple. Then the temple had to be there. So there's some things that aren't there yet, i.e. the temple. But the city. So you say, okay, there are some things. And by the way, I think about the seventh week. When that seventh week begins, 220 days after the seventh week begins, he's going to reinstitute the daily sacrifice and the, and the Mosaic temple worship. Well, 220 days is a very short period of time to build a temple, establish a priesthood, and get that sacramental system and the Mosaic system underway. The resources to do that have to already be there. So my point to you is that there's a lot of things that are going to happen and take place, and the supplies and, and, and all that kind of stuff, I don't... So it doesn't... It doesn't it doesn't bother me to think that there's some stage setting events that would take place. One of the things that, that I, you know, in 1990, I can remember we were riding to church, Wednesday night Bible uh, to church. We, was, we were sitting at Irving Park at, at uh, the railroad track at York Road, listening to Ro Khan and, and his partner on the radio, WGN. And they said, oh, the bombing of Iraq just started. And Desert Storm started that evening. And you think, <coughs> think about what, what they did. In, a, in less than six months, George Bush gathered all the nations of the earth, the free world, together in a coalition, moved 500,000 troops into the Middle East, and in 100 hours, General Schwarzenegger conquered Iraq. Less than 100 hours. We actually had a, a, one of our brothers here, uh, uh, Teddy Reimer, was a tank commander in that. The Olivos, by the way, they were, they were went into the, the, the second time they thought they had the, MD, the M, M, WNDs. They were wrong, but when, when little George Bush did it. But you see how quickly, in six months, you can have this war that the whole world's engaging. So when you see those guys, what does that tell you? What, that this stuff wouldn't, isn't going to take forever to do. But is that what, it's not what prophecy is prophesying about. So you can change the political leadership and so forth there. Those ten kings can, can, can come up pretty quickly. So what does all that mean? Well, I'll tell you three things. Number one, remember that we won't be there. So don't sweat it. We're, until we're out of here, this isn't going to happen. So don't worry about that happening. The prophecy happening. We're, as long as we're here, that's not. And when, when we're out of here and that happens, you're not going to be there. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about the mark of the beast. Don't worry about all that stuff, the war and all that, that stuff. When the dispensation of grace is over, that'll happen. Till then, that's not going to be it. There's no way for you to know when it's going to be. You can't read the tea leaves. If Jesus would tell his apostles, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, it's not for you to know either. So we're not going to know. So trying to figure it out, trying to look, and by the way, looking at what's happening in America isn't the issue. America does not appear in any Bible prophecy. What's going on in the United States has irrelevant to what's going to happen in, the, in that last day. Now, that's hard. That's harsh. It's hard to say. It's hard for us to even imagine. But it's the truth. There is no America in, in Bible prophecy. Now, that can say some things about what you think the future of America is or, or may not. doesn't necessarily mean we're not. There will always be an America, okay? Understand that. Geopolitically, our nation will never go away. It may never again be what it was, but it's never going to go away. And it'll always be an influence. But what happens here isn't the, what happens there. That's the center of, the, of, of God's, God's program. And you just re need to remember you know what time it is. Instead of trying to figure out what's going on there, 
remember, we live in the dispensation of grace. So what we need to do is get on with who we are. And not worry about trying to be somebody we're not. Not worry about a time period we aren't going to be in. Don't sweat it. But get out here and be who you are right now. And be the restrainer of the mystery of iniquity that God made us to be. And as we do that, uh, we know what time it is. It's our time. It's the time of the dispensation of grace. So I know exactly. Paul wrote the, 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 the Thessalonians said, you know the times and the seasons. And we do. What are we? We're in the dispensation of grace. So just remember that. Rejoice in that. Be appreciative of who you are. And when you, you know, I, that verse in Romans 8, he said, now that we are more than conquerors of him that loved us. You know, we're in a complete, total victory program in Jesus Christ. We're conquerors. There's nothing you face that you, that you don't already have the victory over in Christ. But then he says you're more than that. We're not just victors. We're not just complete in Christ. We're more. We have the opportunity not just to be victors, but we have the opportunity to enjoy that victory. To reign in life. You know, when you're a victor, to me the illustration of that verse, humanly speaking, World War II, General MacArthur won the battle in the Pacific. He beat the Japanese Empire. But then he became more than the victor. He went in there and rewrote their constitution, reestablished their government, and led that nation as a leader. He became their friend. He became a mentor. He became more than a victor. He became a ruler. And Paul says, we reign in life. We haven't just defeated the enemy. We reign through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Don't stoop to be somebody you aren't when you can, you, when you can by faith be who God's made you in Christ. So don't get caught up in the being tangled in things of the world. Go out there in the world and be the light. And wherever you are, and if you can be an influence here or there, be that influence for truth. Stand up for it and watch. I, 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 somebody just recently in the radio industry, I was talking to him. You don't know how, how often people come in here and they say, is this all you guys are? Where's everybody? And we're on the radio six days a week in, in, in the second largest radio market in the country. And people say, wow, I thought you were going to be gigantic. And you know what the verse is? Second Corinthians 6, Paul says, as unknown and yet well known, as poor yet making many rich. The spiritual influence you have as a believer, as a grace believer, as a truth teller, is far more influent, is far bigger than what you think it is. Far, far bigger than the size of the preacher and the size of the group preaching it. Because the truth we preach is what the influence is, 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 the, is the issue. So don't, don't get caught up looking around, you know, woe is me. Think, hey, I'm more than a conqueror. I can go out and share this stuff. And then God's truth does the work. I've said to you many times that if you, when in the cities of our country, when the fundamental Bible-believing people fled the, the, the inner cities, truth left. That's where the problems are. They're going to be solved. If truth isn't there, they'll be solved by error because people don't want chaos. Go there and solve, solve, help solve the problems of truth and watch what happens. It's a great day to live and serve the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight for your grace. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for the privilege you give us to live in an era where we can actually make a difference in the world by preaching the gospel of the grace of God and seeing your truth be light in the darkness. We thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, praise the Lord.